Hello, my name is Alex Velasquez, and I'll be helping facilitate today's webinar titled Configure Observability as Code with HashiCorp, Terraform, and Datadog. Thank you all for standing by and welcome. During this session, we will explore how organizations can collaborate to implement observability principles and practices throughout their environments. Please feel free to type your questions during uh, the webinar using the Q&A feature. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available after post-processing, which usually takes two days. Our next slide shows our speakers today. We have developer advocates Rosemary Wan from HashiCorp and Daniel Meyer from Datadog. They will provide us with an overview of Terraform Cloud and Datadog, followed by a demo and then a Q&A session. On the next slide, we have our agenda, where Daniel will get us started. Thank you, Daniel. All righty, hello, everyone. Just as a quick check for Daniel and myself, how is the audio? I know some people mentioned the audio was a little too low, so I want to give a little moment for people to adjust or... Okay, thank you. Just wanted to confirm. So today, Daniel and I are actually going to go through a little bit of observability as code, uh, with specifically with Datadog and Terraform. We have an agenda here. We're going to talk a little bit about Datadog and Terraform. We're also going to talk about the patterns for observability as code. And we're actually going to do a demo showing how Datadog and Terraform integrate. So Daniel, what is Datadog? Well, I'm so happy that you asked. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel. I'm a developer advocate at Datadog. I'm coming to you live from my living room here in Paris. I do not have a green screen. Rosemary's definitely got the leg up on me on there, so please don't mind the mess behind me. Uh, so what is Datadog? Uh, Datadog is an observability platform. Okay, it provides full visibility across your organization. We span end to end from your infrastructure to your network, to applications, to your services, mobile, all the way to whatever's on the back end. Uh, and all the way out to your end users as well. It enables, well, at least the idea is to enable everyone in your organization, uh, ops, developers, security, accounts receivable, finance people, whoever those people are, whatever they're doing, to have a shared understanding of your systems, your applications, your stack, what's going on, and, and basically how your business looks and is postured from uh, a technological perspective. And when problems arise, Datadog helps you to solve them. Uh, we do have a 14-day free trial, so check out datadoghq.com. But that's it for me. As far as the marketing spiel is concerned, we're actually going to get into the goods a, a little bit later. So thanks for listening. <laughs> Exciting. And on the other side of this, we're actually going to show HashiCorp Terraform, and we're going to talk a little bit about Terraform Cloud. Uh, we actually sort of... Uh, use the open source HashiCorp Terraform to define infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is a pattern that applies software development practices to managing, configuring, and defining infrastructure. So the idea is that you define infrastructure as if it were code, and HashiCorp Terraform does facilitate that. HashiCorp Terraform, of course, has a HashiCorp configuration language. So today what you'll see is a specific language, a DSL, that is oriented toward describing intent of how you define infrastructure through code. We're also going to show HashiCorp Terraform Cloud today. The idea is that Daniel and myself didn't feel like setting up S3 buckets. We didn't really set up uh, any additional infrastructure required. Really what we wanted to focus on today was showing how you can create Datadog monitors and dashboards through HashiCorp Terraform and explain some of the patterns that you might encounter when you're trying to configure observability as code. So just to make it easier on ourselves, we actually use HashiCorp Terraform Cloud. It's a SaaS platform that has the state management for Terraform as well as the remote execution. Basically, the way that Daniel and I have worked the past week is that we've been pushing uh, to Terraform Cloud through VCS, through various VCS and, and version control systems, and we've been collaborating that way. So it's been really fascinating to go through that. Now, the big question that we want to answer today is what is observability as code? And just as infrastructure as code is a way to apply software development patterns to infrastructure definitions and configuration, similarly, you want to try to configure your observability 
using definitions and configurations. The idea is that observability is usually something you curate. You look at dashboards, you look at monitors, and you adjust those thresholds typically manually. You'll look at them and say, is this right for this application? Is this the dashboard that best represents metrics for my business? And the bespoke nature of monitors and dashboards means that sometimes it's very difficult to duplicate when you try to scale this. So if you think about hundreds of services in your organization, and even more than just hundreds of services, just think about the microservices architectures that you have, you maybe want to have multiple types of monitors depending on the service you have or the information you need to display to your business. It's no longer scalable to configure a bespoke dashboard every time, and it's no longer scalable to collaborate on alerts as many others are trying to adjust thresholds and understand what's going on with your observability. Is there anything I missed, Daniel? I, uh, there's nothing you missed. If I could just sort of amplify that a little bit for those in the audience that are familiar with DevOps principles, uh, there's a pretty common acronym, which is CAMS, C-A-M-S, and, and the A and the M and the S are a lot of what we're going to be covering today. So automation, uh, measuring, and sharing. So what Rosemary touched on, we're talking about the proliferation of services, the proliferation of software, the complexity of observability that's scaling up uh, you know, almost logarithmically along with, with the complexity of services, what we're going to be looking at today is a big part of how do we automate that, right? How do we take that, that bespokeness? How do we standardize it? And how do we make it manageable, right? And then, of course, how do we share that? Because we don't generally work in a vacuum. Uh, and it's important that we have the same shared understanding of what's going on, why it's going on, how it all works. So that's the good stuff today. Yeah, it's going to be a little exciting. We'll see what happens. But the key part of the Datadog and Terraform integration relies on the Datadog provider. So Terraform has providers. Uh, these are extensions to the core code of Terraform, right? So Terraform in itself has Terraform init, Terraform plan, Terraform apply. Those are the common uh, applications that you would, you know, you executions you would actually use with Terraform. And in order to really leverage the extensions into the ecosystem, whether it be cloud providers or any other sort of API that you want to integrate with, we have this idea of Terraform providers. So Datadog has a Terraform provider, which is very convenient for us because it's amazing uh, to be able to automate the creation of dashboards and monitors using the Datadog provider. What's neat about Terraform providers and the real value behind it is that the logic to handle, create, read, update, and delete functions are internalized within that provider. So as I was doing Datadog APIs a couple years ago, uh, I did not know there was a Terraform provider available. Uh, and there was, a, there was a bit of a concern trying to uh, you know, automate against the Datadog API. I had to remember which dashboards I created, which monitors I didn't, and even more. So the Datadog provider actually is a way to encapsulate all that logic and create that. So let me just make sure that I reshare because I see that there's some concern. Let's so while Rosemary is doing that to talk a little bit about the Datadog provider and, and Terraform, the stuff that we're going to be looking at today uh, certainly, to be fair, is, is some demo material that we put together to try to cut right to the heart of, of what we want to explain. But we're looking at real tooling here, right? This isn't uh, the provider itself is, is the real provider. The configuration language and, and syntax and code we'll be looking at is, is the real deal. And uh, to be 100% transparent, at Datadog, we use Terraform to deploy Datadog, right? So we actually use this provider, we use this technology uh, every day for what is a staggeringly large uh, technical deployment across, you know, multiple cloud providers in multiple zones around the world, 100% Kubernetes. So uh, it is it is the real deal. This works. <laughs> yeah. So there is actually um, a neat part about Terraform providers. You don't necessarily need Terraform Cloud. 
in order to use any of these providers. So Datadog you could use without Terraform Cloud. Uh, like, as I mentioned before, Daniel and I really didn't feel like spinning up S3 buckets for state management, especially because there's two of us collaborating in, uh, you know, in different parts of the world. So what we actually did was we used Terraform Cloud just to facilitate the state management as well as the remote execution of the provider itself. But the provider, you can feel free to use locally or you could use it in any configuration that you might already do with Terraform. All right, so let's get to the heart of this, which is the demo, right? All right, I am going to change the screen. You should see a store dog application. Please let us know if you do not see the store dog application. All right, Daniel, what is exactly store dog? Store dog is your source for buying dogs. No, <laughs> it is it is an e-commerce website, right? Uh, it, it's, it's not real. You can't actually buy anything from it, uh, but it is uh, a deployable piece of software. It's all containerized. It's very nice. We're actually going to have some, some links at the end of the presentation today where you'll be able to check out the repositories for this if you want to spin it up and play around with it. It's a Rails application. Uh, we use it here at Datadog basically just as a sandbox to play around with. It's got a web front end, it's got a Postgres back end, it's got a, a number of services which are connected together. It has some instrumentation built into it. So it's a really convenient way to basically go from nothing to something if you're interested in trying out Datadog or, or frankly any sort of observability or deployment tooling or anything like that. So what we're looking at here is the web interface. Uh, it looks like a website, <laughs> right? We can add some items, we can remove some items. Uh, the, the actual web interface here is not particularly interesting, right? What's interesting is what's going on behind the scenes. So for something even as simple as a website with a cart and some items, and you think, wow, that, that, how complex could that be? Well, in the world of modern computing, turns out very complex, <laughs> right? So this Apple code that we have here, just to make that go, as you can see here, is running uh, a series of services. Uh, and again, this is built on top of Rails. There's a Postgres backend, uh, SQLite to do some you know, caching communication between that and some services. One, for example, to provide advertisements, another that manages discount codes, uh, the store itself, right? So that, that would be like the, the, the mechanism behind the scenes there and then the front end. So uh, we have spun this up and we'll show you how it was deployed. We'll show you how, uh, where it was deployed from. Uh, spoiler alert, it's Terraform, right? <laughs> and then we're actually going to take and make some changes and see what happens. And then to also, of course, take a look at what observability means in this context, because it's all well and good to talk about a Rails app and Postgres, but what's really interesting here is, okay, great, what does observability mean in this context? And, and that's where we're gonna really focus in. Yeah, so what we're going to do is indulge in a hypothetical scenario where we're going to deploy a new version of our application. Now, I understand there are many ways to deploy an application. There are better ways of doing it than doing a blue-green, for example, in Terraform, uh, but actually we're going to do a blue-green in Terraform, and that's just for ease of use. The reason why we've done it this way is that the application itself is running on a GCP instance, so what we're going to do is actually go into Terraform Cloud and toggle it to deploy a new version. So as you can see here, we have Terraform Cloud. This is the SaaS. It's just so we can use state management, remote execution, and we can also set up version control. It's an easy way to put together a bit of CI, continuous integration, continuous de uh, delivery, specifically through Terraform, right? It's an easy way to get started. So we have some infrastructure we set up previously. This is a construct called the workspace. It's an isolated set of uh, resources in Terraform. So here, what I'm just going to do very quickly is go to variables. As you can see, I can define some Terraform variables here. Some of these I'll explain, others not so much, but the important one is here, fixed front end. Uh, this is so we can actually tell the difference. But if in the hypothetical, we deploy a new instance, for example, maybe I'll update this to version two. And so, I'm going to actually go here and queue a plan. I'm going to say update to a new version of application. Queue plan. All right, 
let me see. Apparently, we still have some issues with the sharing. So let me share this one more time. Uh, let me share the whole desktop. We'll see if that is actually a little bit better if those cannot see this. All right. Hopefully that should see Terraform Cloud browser interface. So what you'll see here is that it is actually going to plan and apply. Notice I'm not running this locally. I'm not running uh, a Terraform plan or a Terraform apply on my machine. All I'm doing right now is deploying a new version of our application, of our e-commerce application, and this is automatically running using, Ter using Terraform Cloud. So the important piece of this is that we've actually isolated our application deployment setup away from our alerts. So what you'll see here uh, is that our, our alerts are configured in a different workspace. We don't want to mix up the two in state. We want to isolate them because if someone makes changes to the application, we don't necessarily want those dependencies fully reflecting all the time in our alerts. Maybe we want to separately manage them. So that's just a quick overview of what we've a done right now. quick question for you there, Rosemary. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand completely the idea of splitting these two things up. And, and to those watching uh, live, this is a legitimate question I have. I'm asking right now. We did not rehearse this. Uh, what, what would you say is the best practice here? To, to keep them in separate repositories? To keep them together? Is there a reason you do one or the other? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it boils down to Terraform mono repository and multi repository patterns, right? You can decide to do various forms of code management. In our case, we are actually deploying it in a mono repo form. So what you'll actually see is the setup is a subdirectory in our version control. So as you can see, setup here is what is actually getting run by our infrastructure setup. The other uh, alerts and the dashboards are separately configured by the top level repository. So you can use a mono repository format, put them both together and execute using your CI framework. In this case, we're using Terraform Cloud to do so, but using your CI framework, the idea is that you would be able to execute into subdirectories if you're doing this mono repository format, thereby preserving the alerts with the application. On the other hand, if you have a common set of alerts that you're expecting for your microservices, for example, you're always going to need, let's say, error rates, you may want to actually take that out, put it in a separate repository, test it, manage it separately, and consume its self-service as part of your applications or your application alerts. So there are many patterns to this. It's a matter of whether or not you want to continue with a code management pattern of a mono repository and you have a build system to accommodate for that, or you use a multi-repository formulation to scale. So in other words, the, sh the short answer is it depends. Yes, it is a very much an <laughs> it depends answer. Uh, <laughs> but speaking of the repository that we have here, I think we should maybe drill down and understand how exactly we are using Terraform here to actually define some of the Datadog alerts. So, the fantastic part about this is that Daniel was able to help me kind of organize some of these alerts uh, and kind of understand what we're looking for in this application. So the end result of what you will see is the uh, in the Datadog dashboard here, the end result that you will see is usually this service uh, has this monitor, service has this monitor, service has this type of monitor. And if I go actually look into the details of this monitor, you can see that Datadog allows me to configure queries, it allows me to configure alerts, it looks for certain metadata as well. In this case, I'm looking for environment Ruby shop, my service is store front end. And in this particular uh, case, I'm looking for a high error rate. So as you can see here, all of this is actually configured in Datadog and you could do this manually. But you can actually, besides doing this manually, you can actually scale this for collaboration for other services. And that's where we actually use Terraform to facilitate that. So this is a Terraform configuration file. It is using the Datadog provider that we were mentioning before. And one of the big parts of this uh, resource here is this Datadog monitor definition. So as part of the Datadog provider, you can define the name of the, the particular alert or monitor you're looking to configure. You can also look for the message and you could look for the query. You'll also be able to define the thresholds. All of this is very congruent with the Datadog API as well. So some of these fields you'll see are actually going to match up to the Datadog API. 
And fun trick, if you ever are confused about what to populate in these fields, uh, I actually go back here and once I manually create the alert, I'll actually go to this gear here and you can click export and it will actually have this JSON for you. So you'll be able to see sort of the fields, how they're defined, which queries, and it gives you a more accurate picture of the schema for data dogs monitors. So this is a neat way to just get a better understanding of that. This, by the way, is a completely legitimate workflow, right? Uh, if you're starting from zero or you're starting from a, a point of unknown, right? You're not sure exactly what do we monitor? What are the thresholds? How, how do we do this? That's totally okay. Everyone has to start somewhere, right? So go in, set, set something up, play around in the interface, right? Do a little pointing and clicking. It's totally okay. And then once you're happy with the result or at least satisfied, right? For a first go, for a first experiment, uh, as Rosemary mentioned, just hit that gear export. It's like a cheat sheet, basically. Uh, and you just copy and paste it right in, right? Yeah. So, yeah it, it, and again, don't, don't worry about, you know, oh, yeah, but like, everything should be in code. And, you know, like how I should be committing things directly because that's what senior programmers. No, no, no. Really, just point and click for the win. Use the cheat sheet. You're good to go. <laughs> exactly. Now, something that's really important to know about Terraform and also the Datadog provider is that if you create a monitor manually through Datadog, so for example, if I go in here and I actually go to manage monitors and I create a new one, this new monitor that I've created within the UI is not something that's automatically imported into Terraform state, right? So this is manually created. It is a one-off. It's not automatically imported into Terraform state. And the important part about this particular provider is that there's no mechanism right now to data source it into Terraform state. So there's currently no implementation for you to directly uh, import or data source this into Terraform state if you manually create it here. That's why once you finish creating the Datadog monitor, you can export and then map those fields to a specific resource in Terraform. But in the case of manually creating the monitors through the UI, they are not automatically imported as part of Terraform state. So- but Of course there, mm -hmm. the, the nice part about Terraform is that w once you've done it one time, you can just do it over and over and over again for all of your services. It's quite likely all of your services you're gonna be wanting to look at one of the four or two of the four, or all four of the golden signals. There's no reason to bespoke that by hand each time. Do it once, let Terraform do the rest. Yeah. And it's really, you know, I think that the good part about defining these in Terraform is that what we've done is actually be, we've used Terraform 0.12 iteration. So those who are more familiar with Terraform, we've used the richer type system in 0.12 to iterate through this list of services and be able to create this across multiple services. So actually what's very easy to use in Datadog is actually looking at that monitor, setting it up, understanding that query, and then we actually define a set of variables here Sorry. Yes, a set of variables here. And what you'll actually see is that we've used this richer type to define the service object, service key, error rate, average latency, et cetera. Now, you may choose a different object schema, right? And in this case, it will just map it. Terraform will map it to, ter to Datadog. Uh, you can choose high error rate and then the list of services and the thresholds. The idea is that you choose it based on the sort of organization you want to have as part of your Terraform uh, configuration. So here, what you'll see is actually this is a particular to iterating over the set of services. And actually what we do is we, def we go ahead using sort of the auto bars. So this will auto populate in Terraform Cloud. But here what we've actually defined is service pager duty service key, which is actually really cool. I love how you can also configure the pager duty integration uh, using the Datadog Terraform provider, and then it will actually uh, organize that for you. Uh, we'll define all of the thresholds here for every single service, and all of these are actually created within Datadog as such. Uh, and to be clear, that pager duty key that's in there is a dummy key. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it does not work. It's not attached to any accounts. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So one thing you'll notice that we've refreshed, there's some uh, latency concerns right now. Um, but you know, we remember we deployed a new version, we've let it run for a little bit in production right now. Uh, and maybe we get some alerts from our customer success team and they tell us that something is wrong. So Daniel, what do I do to, to understand what's going on? I don't see anything wrong within this dashboard. 
Well, to be clear, we do see a, at least a warning, right? But uh, this is, I suppose, where we get into the lesson of, you know, it works good in theory, but uh, theory and practice are they exactly the same thing, right? So this is a scenario that happens all the time to everybody, right? The, the, the website is up, the board is green, but you have somebody coming to you and saying, I, it's not working. There's, it's slow. Uh, people are getting errors. I don't understand what's happening, right? And so you go, okay, no problem. I'm just going to hop into my uh, the data dog, my observability tooling, whatever it is, and go take a look. And it, well, it looks like everything's okay. A little bit of latency, but hmm, well, no. let's go to actually take a look at that error rate because that's what the customer success team was reporting. They said, we have customers who are getting errors. What, uh, what's happening here? So we go down, we'll take a look. And we see, oh, well, wait a minute. Actually, there is something going on here. Definitely, there's, a, there's been a spike, right? But how come the monitor is not picking it up? So we have to do a little bit of investigation, right? So here, we'll actually take a look at, uh, yeah, well, there's a little bit of cheat here. The, the, the mouse is going to actually give you an idea of what we're looking at here. Is it greater than 10, right? So we're looking at, is the error rate greater than 10? And that's fine. But if we actually take a look down, we analyze what's in that graph, take a look at the units that are being used, right? They're decimal units. So, mm. <laughs> right? So new ones. Whoops. Right. right? <laughs> now, is this a little bit of a contrived example? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but honestly, this is stuff that, that real, you, know, you run into in the real world all the time. So how are we gonna fix this? Well, we could fix this manually. And if we'll scroll down here in the screen, We'll actually uh, see if, you know, um, or actually, we'll, sorry, scroll down on the screen. We'll click the little gear up in the corner. Yeah. We'll and edit it. Hit okay. edit. And we'll be able to see here where the thresholds are set, right? And we'll see that under define the metric, express these queries as A divided by B, which is a pretty straightforward default, right? Uh, errors and hits, done. And then we have our other thresholds, just simple integers, which were set to like, uh, I don't know. 10 and eight, does that sound good? Maybe, <laughs> but again, as it turns out, this is actually a ratio, not simple integers. So there's a couple of ways that we could solve this problem. Uh, we, we could either uh, make it so that the queries are true to the source data, or we could make it so that the query is true to what humans expect. Uh, Rosemary and I actually had a, a, a discussion about this <laughs> when we were planning this out and Rosemary won, her arguments were, Pretty, pretty solid, frankly. So the solution here is just to express this uh, as a value that the human expects, right? But here's the rub. If we go in and we adjust it here, will it look appropriate in Datadog? Yes, but remember we're talking about observability as code here, right? And if we're changing things here, is that gonna be respected going forward when we re-roll out our code, when we re-roll out applications? The answer is, is no, right? Yeah. So how can we actually take and make this fix? Yeah. And more importantly, we have multiple alerts that are error rates, right? So if you imagine that you've set up Datadog to monitor CPU, you can have a lot of C different CPU alerts. And maybe you want to make uh, kind of edits to all the CPU monitors you have. Well, the problem is if you make a change to one, you have to go through and click find the other error rate and then make the change to everything else because that metric, right, is not valid. That query is no longer valid for any of the other similar alerts that you have. So just to make it a little bit easier, we'll actually go and edit it in an as code way. So we're going to go into our Terraform code. And what we're going to do is actually edit the monitor that we have. So here I have my monitors TF. Uh, this is as code, right? So I've declared this already. And the questionable monitor I have is this high error rate. So I'm going to do edit. Now, don't do this in the, we all have our IDE preferences. Uh, as Daniel told me the other day, GitHub and Git, or GitLab or version control systems are not their own uh, IDEs per se. But uh, I'm doing this so we don't have to go back, flip back and forth into uh, my other IDE. So what you can see here is that I have already this sum trace, et cetera. It's pretty big. There's really not a great way to kind of condense this. You could potentially do some string, uh, some hair doc in Terraform to actually make it a little bit more readable. But as you can see, it's a sum divided by the sum. And what I'm going to do is just change the metric 
uh, to a percent. So it is actually representative of the percent that we've configured as part of the warning and the critical threshold. So I'm going to actually put a decent commit message, which is update error rate to percentage. And I'm going to commit that change. Now you can do feature branching if you want. Right here, I'm committing straight to masters, you know, just using trunk base. Yes, so it actually is very straightforward. And here, what you'll see is actually it's going to run in Terraform Cloud. So as this continues to run, all it will do is look for the differences in what we should see is actually a difference in the query that we had before. You'll notice that it will actually flag that and change it in place. Now you may be thinking to yourself, okay, great, but I mean, that sounds like a lot of work to add a times 100 to a monitor, right? <laughs> and yeah, okay, fair. <laughs> That's a fair criticism, but again, we're using this to show the principle, right? The idea is that you probably have tens, dozens, hundreds, thousands of services that you, you may be managing either as part of your own stack, either as part of stacks you're managing for your customers and your clients. And if you have to make a, a simple change like this, but you have to do it 50, 100, 1,000 times, it's really nice to be able to just go right into the code, do it there, get it over with. Uh, Maybe we'll get into this a little bit later about some ways to sort of extend this. But one of the nice things about this is that if you're using, you know, CI CD tooling, if you're using testing, you can actually start to imagine ways where you could actually be building out monitors, where you could actually be building out tests, quote unquote, in a programmatic way around this stuff, right? Like if you know you have some variables in your application, whatever that means, that, that have to be between a certain threshold, then you know what the monitor for that's supposed to look like. So you can just generate that Terraform code when you generate that code, when you push that out. Yeah. And that's really powerful. Yeah. And what's actually kind of nice to see as part of this example is that you know, ignore the four to change. One of them is actually the, page, the, the fake pager duty integration we set up, but it will actually flag that the three error rate specific alerts and monitors will actually be updated together and it actually lets you know which ones are going to be updated. So you actually have a good sense of that. And what Daniel mentioned about testing, looking at values, just as sort of an add, uh, this is not part of the free tier of Terraform Cloud, but just as an add, you can also include a Sentinel policy. So as you can see here, what I'm checking is, let's say a compliance officer wants me to ensure that it all goes to pager duty. Here, what I'm going to do is actually put pager duty and check if it's all in the messages. So you can similarly check, does this service have the right threshold? Does this have the correct, uh, you know, sort of targeting? Does it have the correct messaging? Does it have something that I'm expecting to, so to see? So you can do this as part of sort of the Sentinel policy itself to examine those monitors. So you're really approaching this as, let me actually execute this configuration and ensure that it is going to be compliant or it's actually going to reflect the expectations that I have. So I'm actually going to confirm and apply this and you can comment or not. In this case, because I have the commit, uh, you know, located here, I think that this is pretty sufficient to describe what's going on. I don't necessarily need to comment, but here it will actually run and it will apply the changes to the data dog monitor. So it will take some time for this to actually reflect. Now that it's been changed though, we'll actually refresh this and I'll actually show you that the change has gone to Datadog specifically. So actually right here, you'll notice that it now has that times 100 and it's done it across the three. All right, we're going to wait a bit for it to trigger, right, Daniel? Because it will take a little bit of time to show that it's uh, at the end of the day, it's statistics, right? Yes. So uh, we're talking about statistical validity on things, uh, time spans, time series, so on and so forth. What we've got configured here is, is set to some relatively generic defaults. You know, it, it has to be at a certain threshold for a certain number of minutes, and, and that's fine. Uh, not going to, you know, be getting too deep into that. Uh, so it does take a second to refresh, but what's it going to refresh? It's going to refresh, and it's going to be an error. We already know what an error looks like, right? So. Uh, I think another thing that might be kind of interesting to, to look at is, you know, okay, we get it. We know what alerts are. We know what monitors are. We, we saw a little bit of how to, how to make that go. Is there anything else that we can do with the Terraform provider? 
Yeah, so there's actually a number of things. You mentioned synthetics before. We're not going to go through synthetics. Um, but the other bit of this is that if you want dashboards, right, you want to demonstrate some kind of, uh, you know, metric for the business, this could be some transaction number. It could be something that is viewable for and consumable for someone. But in this case, we've actually gone and done some kind of Docker container dashboard. The idea is that this is so you get a, a single view of our e-commerce containers on all of the e-commerce uh, applications that are running. I'm going to, it's going to be very small, but it's so the dashboard fits. Uh, but as you can see here, there's going to be, you know, some information here from the container level. So let's say if you have, if you've deployed a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you know, you maybe you want to be monitoring these, or if you want to collect, you know, transactions, you know, coming from the Datadog traces. So let's say we'd want to create dashboards. Uh, well, again, the easiest way is to manually create the dashboard in Datadog first, uh, figure out what widgets you want to place, grab the correct uh, information, you know, information and queries, test out, make sure that dashboard looks the way you want it to. Uh, and the easy thing to do is once again, export the dashboard JSON. Uh, and what you'll actually see is a JSON uh, blob that will output as part of that. I've actually saved this JSON blob just so it's easier to view. But what you can see is that this actually references sort of the descriptions, the widgets that you would like to see, as well as the queries and some of the titling and the specific, uh, let's say, colors and fonts and stuff. But um, in Terraform, this is not, this JSON blob, sorry, is not equal to the Terraform schema that is expected, right? So we have to sort of transform this JSON into a schema that's expected by Terraform. So what we actually do is take this blob, and I have done this uh, terrible JQ query. <laughs> it looks intimidating, but it is reproducible. The idea is that you can take it and manipulate the JSON, uh, take out some fields. For example, some fields are not valid as part of the Datadog API schema. So those things are taken out. So what this JQ does is remove some of those uh, fields. It also sort of manipulates some of the widget types into uh, the schema definition that Terraform expects, but the neat part is I don't actually have to change this out of uh, JSON. What I actually do is use JQ to manipulate to a new JSON, and this new JSON schema is following the Terraform JSON schema. So I'll actually apply this just as the same way as a typical Terraform uh, Terraform file in HCL. So it's nice, does something in 0.12, but it makes it really easy because the Datadog provider is written in a fantastic way that it actually preserves a large amount of the schema. So you have to make some minor manipulations so that it can actually be redeployed in Terraform. But once you do, you can actually use these uh, var application, you can use interpolation, and you can apply this to, uh, the, to specifically the uh, Terraform configuration that you have. So as you can see here, uh, well, you'll actually all of this here uh, was originally based on this uh, general Docker containers dashboard previously. Let me go back. It was based on this Docker containers dashboards. I exported it and then I made some edits to scope. I made some edits to the titling just so that it took in some parameters from specific from uh, Terraform. And the idea is that I can distribute this dashboard if another team, let's say, wants to use uh, something similar they can just change the variable of the specific uh, dashboard titling and some of the scope, and they'll be able to reproduce this. So what's nice about you... this mm -hmm. is, is that at the end of the day, it's just JSON, right? And then there's just API calls that are made behind the scenes to build these dashboards. So once you get familiar with the API, once you get familiar with the objects that are inside of this, you could basically start treating it like, like building blocks, like widgets, right? And so, if, and we're talking about observability as code, right? If you have your code that's being pushed out, and you know that code, you, can, you know you want a particular dashboard associated, you know you want a particular grouping of information to be visible on a, you know, on a, on a time board, right? That can just be built out and deployed along with your code, right? Because at the end of the day, these are just, these are just bits and pieces. And you can assemble them any way you want. Rosemary used JQ for example, uh, but you don't have to, <laughs> right? You could use Python or Perl or Go or, you know, whatever you like. Uh, and, and you can reuse these elements 
to, to build out these dashboards programmatically, which is, you know, really, it's, I think it's fun. I think it's a fun thing once you get used to it. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the few things that you can do in the Datadog uh, with Datadog Provider and uh, Terraform. There's actually a whole list of them, synthetics we mentioned briefly, but uh, there's some pretty cool things that you can configure. The idea is that you will be, the idea is if you get this pattern in place, you'll be able to bundle these kinds of configurations together and offer them self-service and say, hey, are, if you're running, uh, you know, let's say some microservices in Java, here is a bun here's a module, Terraform module you can use to create yourself a really nice dashboard that helps inform some things that you might be seeing in your systems. You can also create some common alerts that we know are happening you know, from certain systems and from certain containers. So the idea is that you'll be able to offer this sort of as a, in a self-service way. All right, so we should be back at slides. Let me know if you can't see this resources page. So for everybody in the chat who was asking about, can we see the repositories? Can we see the code? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> and and this, is the, this is the screen that you wanna be uh, capturing right now with whatever screen capturing tool that is native to your operating system. Uh, take and grab this now. Uh, the first two, just sign up for a free data trial, check out Terraform Cloud, super fun. Uh, the docs for the provider, which are excellent, uh, they are kept up to date, so don't worry about that. Uh, and then the StoreDog application itself, which you are free to spin up at your leisure in your own environment. So some Docker, uh, Docker compose files are provided for that. And the Terraform configuration, which is really exactly what we were looking at in this presentation is available for you to look at as well. There's no smoke and mirrors here. You can take and examine it 100%, everything we just showed you and more. Here it is. <laughs> yeah. And now I guess it's time for Q&A. No time like the present. So oh, yeah. <laughs> the very, very first question that got asked is the very first question actually uh, that Alex asked and then I said I would answer it live. So here it is. The question was, <laughs> does Datadog support structured application logging, distributed tracing, custom application metrics? The answer to all three is yes. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel and Rosemary. It, is, uh, it was really interesting and we have a lot of questions. Uh, so I'll just randomly pick some. Is it possible to import the Terraform state or even the resources for the Datadog provider from existing dashboards? Yeah, so I think we briefly discussed this. Right now, there's not a way for the provider to do so. Uh, the sort of the, uh, per, the pattern right now is to manually export the JSON and make the updates. Okay. Um, another best practice question, perhaps for later on, uh, is if you create a monitor with uh, Terraform, do you recommend making the thresholds defined for altering, as, as an example, ignored by subsequent plan apply to changes from the web GUI to uh, alert thresholds to not get reset? Uh, I don't know for who would this question be? So if you create a monitor with Terraform, do you recommend making the thresholds defined for alerting ignored by subsequent plan apply? So changes from the web GUI to alert thresholds do not get reset. Um, you could possibly do so, Daniel. I think there, I think that has some merit if you want to ensure that you're not, you're not going to, uh, you know, sort of override the, t the thresholds. Um, I think it would be similar to sort of the toggle we showed before, which is you could tell it to not use that value uh, or to hold off on that value for a period of time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's, there's a certain amount of best practice there. And, and I think there's also just a certain amount of uh, this personal style there, honestly, right? It comes down to how you want to manage your infrastructure, how you choose to, to manage your observability tooling. In this case, we're talking about Datadog, but I mean, it could be anything, right? Uh, and and that's, that's less about how to do it right and more about how you are doing it, <laughs> right? Because that's kind of by default the right way. <laughs> okay, uh, one more here. Um, are there any plans of having a tool which converts the exported JSON file of the Datadog monitor dashboard, et cetera, and converting it into Terraform code? Uh, pull requests welcome. 
<laughs> I think it's I mean, I think it'd be interesting to put that as part of the provider as I think it would it would sort of be embedded as part of this import um, where you'll be you the idea is you would import the schema from Datazog API into the specific dashboard. Um, but, you know, the trick is that API schemas change it change quite a bit with any provider does it's not just uh, Datadog's providers in particular, but any provider uh, is subject to API schema changes from the upstream service. So it could very well be that, you know, until that schema solidifies, then, you know, then it makes a little bit sen more sense to include that import command. Uh, but, you know, I think if you want a PR on the, uh, to create the import, those are much appreciated. To be clear, all of this is, is, is open source. Right, uh, you know, t HashiCorp has a long and a proud history of open source. Uh, we do a lot of open source work at Datadog as well. So when I say pull requests, welcome. I'm, I'm not being flippant. Uh, really, right? Get involved in the community. If you have ideas, even if you don't know how to code, you know, drop an issue, hop on the community slacks, get those discussions going because this is I mean, this is how great features get developed, right? Okay, uh, one more here. What is the most secure way to store credentials for Datadog API authentication using Terraform? Do you use Vault or leave them in plain text in the state file? So the current approach that I've demonstrated here is through um, the environment variables. So the API credentials, for example, um, it, you know, with the Datadog provider specifically are going to be done through, I, I usually use Datadog app key and Datadog API key as an environment variable. And that general, if it's provider input, right, that's generally not going to be reflected in state. However, if you notice the setup before where I injected the Datadog API key, I believe there was a question someone asked if there was a Datadog agent, uh, did the Datadog agent have to exist on an instance? Um, Yes, it has to be there. Uh, in this case, we have a Datadog container that reads all the other containers, um, but it doesn't need to be in Terraform Cloud. Uh, it just needs to be uh, in the deployment that is uh, sort of in the same place as all of the monitoring that you would like to do. So the Datadog API key that you, see, you saw during the setup part portion is not, you're correct, it would be in state. And that kind of injection is not something uh, sort of the encryption of sensitive variables within state is something that we're continuing to figure out as part of Terraform itself. Um, so in terms of protecting that key, the best place to do it is store in vault and encrypt your state file. Make sure that you um, have access control set on the state files themselves so that no one can just go in and retrieve that Datadog API key. But that's if you're doing this injection pattern where you're injecting it into a GCP instance or a container. It's not uh, the same if you're using the Datadog provider to create alerts and dashboards. One of those it depends answers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, another uh, picked completely random question. When applying a plan, how do you segregate common monitors from app specific ones? I'd want to maintain common monitors across various services and still have support for app specific monitors. Daniel, oh, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, this was a randomly selected question and actually extremely pertinent. Rosemary and I were literally working on this uh, a couple of hours ago, right? Was, was how do we separate out things that are common, things that are repeatable patterns that are, are even going to be the same values or values that are subtly changing, but over vast swaths of infrastructure versus, you know, the one-offs. Right, uh, and I hate to give an it depends answer, but again, it depends. There's a couple of different ways to do it, but a fairly straightforward way and uh, a, frankly, a, a valid legitimate way to do it within the context of a Terraform is to have uh, a, you know, a, a Terraform declaration that's gonna go through those repeatable patterns that are parameterized that have variables declared in them, and then just have a second Terraform file that has that one-off in it, right? And it's okay to hard code that one-off if it really is the only instance of, of that snowflake in your entire infrastructure, right? Uh, that happens, <laughs> right? We like to think it doesn't happen. We like to think that, that everything we do follows these beautiful ivory tower patterns and, and you know, that, that 
tries to be true, but there's always going to be edge cases. And in the case of those edge cases, you know what, don't, don't break your head over it. Just put it into another Terraform file and, and deploy that up. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it's nice to have maybe a standard set you can expose by a Terraform module. And if your app has some really specific ones, like in the example that we had here, uh, and you go to this code repository, you can see the store front NP90 anomaly monitor uh, that Daniel created. That one is actually very specific to the store front end. So that one you might put as a bit of a one-off from your application, but you can still consume and create the other standard specific, um, standard, let's say microservices specific uh, alert bundles or alert and uh, sort of configurations as a Terraform module as part of your application deployment. So there are a lot of patterns to this, but you are more than welcome to create sort of these one-off monitors as part of your application. Great. One more question. Currently, all resources are provider dependent. Is there a plan to create an abstract provider independent model for common resources? That will greatly simplify the portability. So there is, I think that the easiest thing to describe as part of uh, providers in general is that the providers have a very strong expectation, Terraform providers and the way Terraform providers are developed, have a very strong expectation of schema. And that is where the nuances of determining the differences between meta, you know, the important metadata you're looking for uh, will get actually generated as output. So it's difficult to create sort of a generic object uh, with sort of uh, generic schemas or, or more general schemas because then you lose a bit of the diff, right? It, it loses the strength in making comparisons and it loses a bit of the um, value of understanding which attributes are being changed. Now, it's not to say that this can't happen. Um, certain, certain providers may actually create gener may actually create more generic objects. Uh, in the case of Datadog's provider, it's not, the value isn't necessarily fully there, um, but some of the providers who change very, very rapidly in their API schema, they may develop in a way that actually has a generic object in particular. Um, but again, doing that, the architectural approach uh, kind of loses the value of understanding and assessing the changes that come as part of Terraform. Okay, thank you. Um, can you please provide an example on how to automatically correlate multiple alerts and suppress certain alerts so we don't get multiple alerts? Do we do that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. a good question. Uh, perhaps a little out of scope if we're talking about, uh, you know, Terraform and observability as code. So I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit of a summary answer there. Uh, in, in Datadog in particular, you'd be looking at a composite monitor, basically, right? So a monitor built up of other monitors. Um, the idea there is that you would set up uh, a, a particular series of monitors, a particular series of thresholds. They could be literally anything, right? Service check, a network check, a ping check, it could be anything, right? And you would uh, not configure any alerting action with them. They would actually just be monitors, not alerts. And then you could create a composite monitor, which is a collection of those that have to meet certain criteria. And there's you know, a, a, a language to describe that. And then you would attach the alert to that composite monitor. And that can all be done via Terraform. Is It's just another type of monitor with another type of alert configuration built around it. We don't have an example to show you, but that's a, a normal standard type of thing, yes. Uh, can you demo or explain exporting the dashboard to port back into Terraform? Yeah, so definitely check out the repository we enclosed here. Um, sort of the, the export, we, we demoed the export, uh, didn't really talk as much about the JQ query. Uh, take a look at the make, fi make file. Uh, it has the set series of um, sort of manipulations you would need to do in order to convert it to the Terraform uh, compliant JSON that it's looking for to convert any JSON object uh, to the Terraform compliant JSON or the Terraform readable JSON, you do have to say resources, the resource name, uh, and as well as a resource identifier, typical to HCL, you would have resource data dog monitor uh, test, for example. So you do have to have that as part of the JSON as well as some other manipulations within the schema itself. So take a look at that JQ query in the make file that will sort of give you an idea of the differences between the schema that Terraform expects and the schema that's coming out of the data dog API. 
And if you've never used uh, JQ before, uh, this is going to be a great way to get your feet wet with the syntax. Uh, again, it looks a little scary. It's actually not that bad. And if you've never used make before, uh, this is also a fun way. <laughs> so, uh, so definitely those you know learning opportunities there. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have time for maybe a couple more. This one seems interesting. We have deployed Datadog to Kubernetes using the Helm chart, and it supports uptime checks via service annotations. What are the main differences between setting them up this way versus using the Terraform <clears throat> Datadog provider, and which way do you recommend? Right. So uh, it's funny, you know, you preface that by saying we have time for a few quick questions. That is a rabbit hole, honestly. Uh, it is, it is a, 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 it's an interesting question, and I mean that sincerely, because there's no right or wrong answer there. There's just trade-offs. And uh, that would honestly be worth doing maybe like a little blog post around or, or even setting up like a second session around specifically around Kubernetes and, and how that works. Um, so I, I hate to not answer that question, right? But the, the best answer I can give there is it's complicated and it's going to depend on how you want to manage your infrastructure and how, what types of deployment tooling that you're using that you feel is appropriate. And uh, are you, are you using Terraform, you know, just to deal with your, you know, underlying infrastructure? Are you using Terraform literally just to roll out, you know, Docker containers, right? Are you using Terraform just for Datadog? And you've got a completely different way of managing your infrastructure and managing your Kubernetes clusters. That, th these are all valid configurations that it could exist in the wild. And as a result of that, there's no one particular answer to give to that question. So, okay. it, yeah. Uh, do I have time to add on to that a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're a little, yeah, we're very okay. close, but sure. Yeah. So, so as a quick note, you know, let's say you are under, you're managing the underlying infrastructure on AWS, for example. So Datadog has an AWS integration. Let's say you deploy your AWS, uh, you know, a room infrastructure resources with Terraform. You want to create CPU memory specific alerts and, and information there. Uh, and you want sort of everybody to have this similar experience. So everything is pretty much all that data is funneled through Datadog. Uh, it's actually something that you know you can still allow those service checks and that information to be configured by automatically by Kubernetes. The Terraform configurations won't override that. So the idea is that maybe you have a combination of the two. The information and the service checks get created by Kubernetes automatically, but some of the underlying notifications that you would require, whether it be, let's say something's rounding out of memory, uh, network connectivity is affected you know, from your cloud provider, all of those uh, other kinds of information, pieces of information allow you to answer questions in a more holistic way. And that's where maybe you use the combination of Terraform declaring the infrastructure, but also Kubernetes sort of creating these automatically. Great. Well, that takes time. Uh, the, and the, the, basically, we're out of time. A lot of questions. Very, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, Daniel, uh, for, uh, for such a good webinar. Um, thank you to the audience. I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar and to have a better understanding of how Terraform Cloud can be paired with Datadog to ensure consistent uh, observability across any environment. Uh, finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make the recording available after processing. It usually takes about two days or so. Uh, we will send that link to everybody who registered to, to this webinar. Have a great day. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>